So, hi everybody. Um, I guess what I'll do is just blab a lot about Renee French for a while and explain and go on about how just totally awesome she is and then ask her about her book. And then after I've done that, you will get the chance to ask her questions about her book and her work in general. And um, don't be shy at that part because that's always the best part of the um, I first discovered Renee's work in the 90s when I kind of was first discovering comics. And the first stuff she did was on a series called Grit Bat and quickly followed by The Ninth Gland. And the thing that I thought as I was reading her was I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know David Lynch drew comics. Um, and it's, I feel like there's an affinity between um, Renee French's work in and, and, and graphics and um, David Lynch's work in film because they both have, I feel like they're both in touch with their inner mutant in ways that most of us just are not. Um, Renee is able to evoke, I think, the discomfort that all of us on some level just feel about being alive and being human and being animals. And she's able to capture that in ways that I've never found anyone else able to capture. Um, and so I've been meeting her ever since. And then I got the chance to meet her eventually and, and become friends with her. And so it's been really neat to have that happen and watch her work change and grow and get um, and then be able to talk to her about it because I actually knew her. Um, so I guess I'm going to talk specifically about her new book, H Day, along the way and ask her questions about it, but I will probably reference other things. Um, if you're looking at H Day now, the first thing you're going to see is number one, no words. Um, number two, we've got left-hand pages that are pretty distinctly different from right-hand pages. And so I guess, Renee, the first thing I'm going to do is kind of talk to you about that because I've talked... Um, I've talked to people who were so struck by the difference in how those pages look that they read all the left-hand pages first from beginning to end. And then went back and read all the right-hand pages first from beginning to end. While I didn't do that at all, I just read it as a conventional book and figured that the reason those images were posited that way is I was meant to draw a relationship between those two images as I continued. Um, and so what that made me do is, um, so if you guys look at the beginning of the book, there's sort of, so it's split up into stages, um, which I interpret to be the stages of migraine. Um, but before you get to the stages, there are some pictures that, um, you know, have, it looks like something almost unfolding in a brain, but then that image turns into a fuzzy landscape. And then that's the fuzzy landscape that um, ends up always being on the right-hand pages. And then we've got this image of a figure. And so, because of that opening, I always, as I read, I interpreted the fuzzy landscape as an internal landscape that was related to the sufferings of the figure. Um, and so, I guess, what, and then also, I guess, when I got to, when you get to so the opening of stage one, there's a picture of a human head with an object inside it. And then at the beginning, you don't have to try to find this in the book, it's okay. And at the beginning of stage two, there's a picture of a dog's head with a thing inside it. And there's a dog that appears in the landscape. So I'm thinking, okay, for me as I'm reading this, the dog is sort of the, the kind of the stand-in for our image of a person in this landscape. And sort of the sufferings of the person are figured as the sufferings of the dog in this landscape. Anyway, I also tend to overthink a lot of things. So the first thing I wanted to ask you, Renee, which is, um, what for you is the relationship between the left-hand and right-hand pages? And was this a relationship that was a founding principle for the book? Or was this something that evolved over time? Yes. <laughs> is that on? Yeah. Um, I think yeah, you nailed it, actually. It's pretty amazing. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's... So, I think it's interesting that people tend to go through the whole thing on the left-hand side, all the way through. Because that's really not what I meant. And, and you're right, that I was pretty careful to keep uh, a relationship between the left and the right in order to um, communicate that that's going on during the left-hand side of the page. Of the, so you're having you're having a migraine, and what's going on inside your head is the stuff that's on the right hand side. Um, and you're right about the dog. The dog is sort of the stand-in for the human who's having a headache, and 
What I wanted is to kind of make a puzzle, too, though, um, where you could spend a lot of time comparing the left and the right. And while you're doing that, kind of get lost in the imagery, the forward and backward, and, and uh, maybe end up with a headache in the end, probably. I don't know. Um, there are certain images, I think, that are sort of a natural part of our lives, kind of our internal lives, in ways that we take for granted, then we make the mistake of talking about them to someone else as if it's a common experience, and they look at us like, what are you talking about? You're a crazy person. And the one for my sister is, um, growing up, whenever, she always knew she was going to get a nightmare, because as she was drifting off to sleep that night, images of kitchens would flash through her mind in a series, always the same kitchens. And she'd be like, okay, tonight's going to be a night I have a nightmare. And she just assumed this, everyone had this because she grew up with it. She's like, everyone gets the kitchens before they have the nightmare. So um, the thing that I'm wondering with you in this what book. What kind of kitchens? <laughs> um, kind of like kittens that, kitch, kittens. Kitchens that you might see in like catalogs, like ideal model kitchens of very, yeah, just For very Micah clean. The... Yeah, clean, orderly kitchens. Wow. I know, isn't that great? Um, so what I was curious of um, was I was looking, when we see sort of the, the images that correspond to what this figure is going through as the migraine evolves, I wanted to know, let's see, I mean, how, were any of those images, you've been a migraine sufferer for your entire adult life, right? And so this is something that's been a part of your experience, and so I was really curious, your visual depiction of migraine for this person. Or have any of these been images? This is just how I think. It, this is is this how you think of how it's been happening to you? Or did you sit down and say, "I want to write a book about migraines," and then you, you invented those images? Or how much? I guess so. How much of it was creative, like putting it on the page, and how much was more of a transcription of images that have been carried with you for a long time as you've been a migraine sufferer? Okay, so I think I don't know if this is interesting to someone who doesn't have headaches, but um... well, actually, start off by talking about what a migraine is for people who don't. Well, um, what it is, medically what it no, is? No, 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 what those do you like? Um, uh, early on in my life, I think, when I was, I would get them, and it would just sort of hit, and I'd be out. And, um, throwing up, and, you know, it was, I mean, the pain is really incredible. It's sort of one side of your head, and you lose, uh, the ability to really verbalize, and sometimes... Um, you also there's some sometimes you get a, a sort of thing in, uh, in your visual field that doesn't go away for about 20 minutes where you're kind of half blind, which is called a um, an aura. Yeah, but um, now I think as I got older, when I hit my 30s, I was able to start to realize, start to f feel when it was coming on. So and now in my 40s when I, I actually can pinpoint it to, you know, I start to get a little twinge right here, and I know it's coming, right here, and then eventually it, you know, sort of branches out of my entire one side of my head, it's just light sensitive, I get nauseated, and, um, and then have to lie down in a dark room and not do anything for a long time. There are drugs now and everything that kind of are pretty good for it, but, um, where was I going with that before you right. described so, it? Right, well, that, that was a great description, so thank you. And uh, so now the, what I guess I'm interested in knowing is your de visual depiction on the left-hand pages of the, the figure experiencing migraine, are any of those like almost transcriptions of images like as you have had migraine over the years, do you think of yourself as having the thing that you're pulling or the thing wrapping around? You know what I mean? Like how That's literal is like it? the feeling of it. Okay. Okay, so like what... and. As I get older, I, I kind of I've developed this like thing that I do to get through it, which is um, visualizing a world. So there's I didn't used to do this. Like I used to just lie down and try to not think about anything. Um, and then, but now what I do is I, I kind of make a world. So I'm lying there. I have a wet washcloth on my forehead, and I think about this place that is just no windows, no doors, just these buildings and, you know, um, and then maybe a dog walking down the street, not doing anything. It's enough that it start to forget about the pain a little bit, if that's possible, and it's not too stimulating. 
So that's, I kind of just decided to document that. And um, the left hand side is more what it feels like. So left hand side, that thing that you said, like strapped to the bed with the like, stuff, that's more like literally what it feels like when you're lying there and, you know, you kind of blend in with the bed, like you're part of it. So it sounds like the images that you've been living with were perhaps the right hand page images. That's migraine land. That's where you've been going for That's years, the comforting years, comfort. years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And perhaps the left hand pages, as you were working on this book, you were sort of creating those for the first time as ways to kind of visualize, help other people to visualize what it feels like. Right. When you're, okay. Exactly right. Cool. Um, so when I was reading the back of the book and I read the words Argentine ant infestation, <laughs> I was rather taken by surprise, um, and I had interpreted, I had a much more just kind of metaphorical swarming thing, and I hadn't thought that there was actually any real world corollary to that, so I want to know where and how does the whole Argentine ant infestation come into things? We live in California now, and um, we, I mean, you know, like here, it, on the East Coast we used to get these ants that were like, you know, they little ants that would come in and a little tra a little you know trail of ants coming through in, into the apartment and um you could pretty much kill them with one of those little trap things. We'll get them they die. And uh so in California there's this kind of ant and um they're awesome. They're like the Argentinian ants and they actually do things like they find a termite colony and they go in and they kill all the germans and they take over. That's how awesome they are. And um, and uh, so we started getting them in the house and they come in, they come in like through the window, it's like the crack in the window and they come in. And we have this dark, um, the kitchen countertop is really dark. And so you go down there and you're making something and suddenly you've got ants all over your arm, right? Just crawling all over, where did they come from? And then, you look and there's this trail, there's this really solid trail of ants all going all across and it doesn't even seem like they're eating anything. Like they're just doing it for fun or something. <laughs> and I've talked to a lot of people in California who have this problem and everyone says the same thing, that you use Windex. So you just kind of, like on the East Coast you boil water and you pour it over and you kill, you know, this mass murder of the ants that way, but you take a Windex bottle and you squirt well, what they do is they get, like, they tell their dude friends, let's, these guys are messing with us, and more come in. And they make, like, a double path. So they, that's where the Windex was, and then they branch off into two different, and you have, like, a mess over there and more over there. Anyway, um, somewhere along there I had a headache. And, uh, um, I was, uh, I think I, I went downstairs, you know, and got my stuff and made my tea and had my cloth for my head and went upstairs I was trying to relax and got upstairs to put the cloth on my head and I had ants on my hand and so then lying down with the migraine it just all everything that I thought of was ants and so they became this where I was having dreams and for, for weeks it was just they wouldn't go away they were in the mailbox like what are they eating in the mailbox it's not like we're Fruitcake? 